All right, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Michael Peters. I'm an engineer at Red Hat. Uh, I work primarily in the security space um, and emerging technologies. Uh, I'm a, a member of the Keylime project. If you're not familiar with Keylime, we'll touch briefly on Keylime in a bit. Um, but uh, today's talk is Zero Trust Workload Identity in Kubernetes uh, is um, really broad. Uh, and all of the, pretty much every slide I have in here could be a whole talk in and of itself. Um, just the, the ideas and concepts behind zero trust, what is identity, um, and, and how that integrates with everything in the, in the uh, cloud native space is um, tricky and myriad. And so we're just going to be sort of doing a general overview of all that. If you want more information, um, I'll try to answer that. So uh, I'm going to make some assumptions as we go. If those assumptions prove incorrect, just let me know, wave, wave your hand and say something, uh, have me back up, whatever, that, that'll work. <clears throat> so talking about zero trust. Um, it's kind of a, a misnomer. Zero trust actually means zero implicit trust. It's not as, um, people don't want to go around, like ZT is a better acronym than ZIT, right? Um, so, uh, but it, it, when we're talking about zero trust, you can't have zero trust. You have to trust something. But what we're saying is we don't trust things just by where they are on the network. Um, so this is an, an architectural pattern where we apply security at the asset level, not the location level. So in the past, a lot of things were set up in this castle and moat scenario, where the castle is your data center and you're trying to protect it, uh, and you have you know, a moat and walls uh, and guards around the, the data center. Um, so your, your, your firewalls, your network segmentation, your ACLs, your VPNs. <clears throat> and so everything was focused on this perimeter security. If we lock everything out, then we can trust everything inside. And that turns out to not be the case for lots of reasons. Um, and even when this was implemented, um, if it was done well, then it was actually a burden and very strict and rigid in how things could be set up. And this led to a lot of the conflict that exists between uh, de developers and operations and developers and security people. Um, and when it wasn't super well done, when it was lax, it let intruders in and there were lots of holes in, in the castle. Um, so as things started to grow and, and the modern world started to change a bit, Right, we have a whole bunch of things coming into microservices and bring your own devices and API gateways, multi-cloud setups and serverless functions running all over the place. And so your definition of, of um, what could be inside of this, these walls changed. And you, you couldn't just always get a VPN connection between one thing or another, or there's a constant battle every time you wanted to bring some new service into your, into your system, you'd have to contact security to set up these you know, tunnels or VPNs or whatever, and, and so it just became this mess. And um, you essentially had a world where the walls of your castle need to basically encompass everything, which just is not possible. So we have a, a larger number of smaller pieces of software, larger attack surfaces, and the old security paradigms of mapping and restricting everything by port and IP addresses just doesn't work anymore. So uh, another portion of uh, zero trust that's important is identity. So it's kind of central to zero trust. And that identity is no longer implicit, but has to be very explicit. Um, identity itself is a little complicated. Like uh, in, in the real world, when, when you're talking about your personal identity or how you prove your identity, you usually have to rely on some third party, right? My government issued ID, well, do I trust your government? It depends, right? If, if it's the state of North Carolina trusting a Seattle driver's license, okay, but if it's me traveling to Paris, they're not going to care that I have a North Carolina driver's license. Right? Just, so the, the, how we trust those third parties becomes part of the identity question. And in the old castle and moat scenario, we have a lot of cases where identity wasn't even existent, right? We, a lot of services could be non-credentialed. It's just that, well, we were both inside the same VPN, so one service can talk to another and we're good. And, and as we go to zero trust and zero implicit trust, we can't have that anymore. So, um, and even in those scenarios where identity was existent, it was usually tied to some sort of shared credential, some secret. Um, so the identi I proved my identity by saying, I have this password, and you recognize that password, and that proves my identity. And this is weak to insider threats. It's weak to credential compromises, credential leaks. If I can get that password, now I can impersonate you all over the place. Um, a secret rotation is hard to do, right? If, if that password gets leaked, now I have to change it in all the right places, and if I don't, don't do it correctly, I can cause outages. 
And then how do we get that secret into the workload to begin with, right? Are we embedded in, in code, which is obviously a bad idea? Are we passing it around through the environment, which could be leaked in other ways? Are we, um, uh, like, how are we, how are we giving that secret um, to the workload? And then um, how do we apply identities to ephemeral things? So we're talking um, serverless functions, we're talking CI, CD build pipelines and things like that, that just, or even just a, a, a natural system that expands and, and contracts um, under its elastic load. So solving this identity crisis is crucial. Identities have to be explicit. Um, ACLs uh, are based on identities, but not just credentials or locations. And everything has an identity um, in a zero trust system. People, machines, workloads, everything. So this is where Spiffy comes in. So just how many people are here familiar with Spiffy? How many people use Spiffy or Spire? It's a little less, okay. So, um, Spiffy started as a project in 2016 by Joe Beta um, and trying to, f to get organizations to come together and take all this knowledge that we have about identity and, and um, security and bring them together into a single project. Um, Spiffy stands for the Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. And they wanted to leverage a lot of existing stuff. So primarily using X509 certificates and uh, JWT, so the JSON web tokens. Um, preferably X509, those are more secure and can be rotated and, and expired. Um, and, but for both of these, there's a lot of tooling available and a lot of systems will, will take them um, as identity to begin with. And so we also wanna identi uh, divorce identity just from the, the, um, the concept of identity from the credential and from the network location. And Spiffy also tries to solve what we call the bottom turtle problem. Is anyone familiar with this old story about turtles all the way down? Okay, so uh, apparently there's this apocryphal story of a, a guy giving a lecture and a lady, a, a lecture about the, the world floating through the, the universe and that this lady, old lady said, no, the world rests on a turtle, on the back of a turtle. And he says, well, what does the turtle rest on? And she's like, Don't, aha, it's turtles all the way down. So like, the, once you have this concept of I need this secret, well, how do I protect that secret? Well, I can use, uh, say, PKI, a public uh, private key. I'll encrypt it with the, the private key and then let go of the public key. Well, then how do I get access to the public key? Or, oh, no, I'll protect that by such and such. Like, so you get in this cycle of I need to protect this credential with another credential with another credential. And so the bottom turtle is what we call our root of trust. Um, there's always a root of trust in the system, even if it's not explicit. So if you don't know what your root of trust is, you're probably in a bad state because you're trusting something, you're putting your weight on something um, that you don't know how strong that is. And um, so for a, a good zero trust system or ZT system, we need a solid root of trust. Um, with Spiffy as our root of trust, um, instead of some ultimate password or last password that we try to protect, um, it, it lets us put the trust in, in something that's solid, which bases the identity not on some shared secret, but on the actual identity of that workload and the nodes that it's running on. And we'll talk about that in a second. How does, how does Spiffy guarantee the identity of that, that uh, ultimate piece? So the Spiffy consists of a couple of things. One, first off, Spiffy is a, a spec. So there's lots of things that can implement Spiffy. And in fact, in the cloud native um, uh, ecosystem, there are a lot of things that implement different parts of Spiffy because they're either consumers or producers of, of different parts of Spiffy. But it consists of several parts. The Spiffy ID, which is a text representation of the identity. Um, the SVID, which is the identity document, um, which is a cryptographically verified document that contains this ID. And it's usually an X509 cert or a JWT. We need the workload API. And this is a node local API that workloads talk to to get their identity, to get these, um, the SVID. Um, we have the trust bundle, which is a set of uh, public keys for that Spiffy issuing authority, uh, and for that sort of defines that what we call the trust domain. Um, and then federation, which allows you to have multiple Spiffy setups that share um, information across explicitly by sharing trust bundles in the, in the federation. So what Spiffy is not, it's not designed for non-software. So this is all about software workload identity. So it's not good for humans, animals, artwork, NFTs, anything like that. Like it's just, this is identifying software. It's also not an authorization framework. Identity is necessary for authorization, 
so you need something to say, what is my definitive identity, or how do I prove my identity? But that doesn't say, can I run this workload? Right? It's not the auth authorization part of that. You have to implement that yourself. And there's lots of things that know how to talk about and with spiffy identities, um, but that, that's not what spiffy does. So it's, it's like tangential. And once you have spiffy and once you have identity solved, then your authorization actually becomes a much easier problem. So the spiffy ID is just a URI with a spiffy prefix. We have a domain, which is our trust domain. So that's everything under this domain is issued by this spiffy setup. Um, and we trust it. And then everything on the path is the identifier. Um, it can be hierarchical. It could be location-based. Like you say, EU versus US, it could be name value pairs. Spiffy doesn't say what this needs to be. You can do whatever you want. That, but that doesn't mean you can do whatever you want, because a lot of systems have their own idea of what the Spiffy ID should look like. And since we're talking about Kubernetes, the Spiffy ID will look something like this with your cluster name as your trust root or your, your uh, trusted domain. The, then we have an NS slash the namespace name slash SA slash your serverless account. And so, this means that our identity of what this workload is is tied to which cluster it's running, which namespace it's in, and what service account it's using. And those are, in most setups in Kubernetes that use Spiffy, our ID for the workload. This means that your service account, you need to be kind of conscious of how you use that and not use that across multiple things that are not the same workload. Or they'll end up with the same ID, and then you can't really distinguish them when you're talking about authorization. Um, but, and it makes sense that like some pods are going to, a lot of pods are going to be having the same ID, right? If they're part of the same deployment or same service, they're going to be, they should logically have the same Spiffy ID. But you should not, re if you're using Spiffy, Inspire, um, you shouldn't be reusing your service accounts where things are not logically the same identity. So that brings us to Spire. So Spire is the Spiffy runtime environment and is the production reference implementation of Spire. And as I said before, Spire's a spec, or Spiffy's a spec. Sorry. This is it's confusing. It confuses me even when I talk about it most of the time. So a lot of times you'll say Spiffy or Spire when you're actually meaning one or the other. I'll try to be explicit when I'm talking about that. And a lot of times when you're talking about just the system in general, you'll say Spiffy Spire, right, to lump them together. But Spire is the implementation, the production implementation of Spiffy. And there's other things that can introduce or that can um, implement different parts of the Spiffy spec, like your service mesh or your um, whatever. Um, and um, this is the, the architecture of Spire. So we have um, a Spire server and agents. So the agents live in Kubernetes uh, on each node as a daemon set. And the, what we call the attestation, which is basically um, some set of, of, of facts that, that we can make provable observations about. Um, this attestation happens between the, the agent and the node. Um, so in, in Spire, we want two identities. We want the node to have an identity, and then we want the workload on that node to have its own identity. Um, so the agents and the server work together to do both. So first off, um, when a node comes up and has a Spire agent come up, it wants to prove its identity to the um, server. And this could be done in a couple of different ways, and there's, there's different ways this happens depending on your environment, but it basically ha comes up with some provable or it facts about the system that it then sends to the server, uh, and then the server, usually by a third party, attests to the validity of those facts. And then once the node has this identity, workloads can then communicate with the agent over this workload API and say, what is, now, now give me my identity. What is my identity? Give me my, my cert that, that asserts my identity. And then the, the agent will query the, uh, the kernel, usually, and other things on the kernel, depending on the plugins you're using, to find out what is the identity of this workload. And then I send that back to the, the um, server to make sure that this workload has been registered. And then I can get this SVID. Now, it seems like a complicated process, but there's a lot of good caching involved in that, so it's relatively quick. Um, and then the identity gives back, is given back at Spiffy ID and an SVID. That's this certificate or, or JWT token that cryptographically validates my identity. The SVID is a short-lived certificate um, that will, uh, that, that, that 
Spire will take care of rotating. The agent will take care of rotating that and then notifying the workload when it's rotated. So if you've ever dealt with like um, SSL TLS certificates and rotation on that, you know how much of a pain it is, right? There's, there's ways to automate that with like Let's Encrypt and things like that, but Spire can take care of all that for you. And you can make these sh um, credentials very short-lived on, on the order of a few minutes if you want. Obviously there's scalability issues in there, so you find the right value, but it means that if this credential is ever compromised, it's usually dead fairly quickly. Um, so this idea of these sort of credentials living outside of the workload but being attached to the workload, um, it, I've heard it referred to as ambient credentials, which I really like, uh, meaning that it's not a, something shared that the workload has embedded, it's not just there, but it accompanies the workload and is part of the workload's identity. So as I mentioned before, Spire uses a plugin architecture. For, um, so the first set of plugins is communicating with the upstream authority. So you can have Spire to be your CA, um, your ultimate root of trust for your, your certificate authority, or you can tie it to an existing CA infrastructure if you have it. Um, and then the other parts of the, the, that are plugins are the node attesters and the workload attesters. And so these would be plugins both on the server and the, the um, agent side. Um, so for instance, let's talk about like a real world scenario like an AWS deployment. If you have a Kubernetes cluster in AWS and you have Spire running on that, the Spire agent will query the um, local AWS API that's available to that node to find out who am I, what is this node, Gath gathers that information, sends it off to the Spire server, and then the Spire server will also talk to AWS out of, bound, uh, out of band to confirm all this information that it just got from the Spire agent. Once they can agree that they both can get the same information from AWS, they can now say, all right, this node is this node in AWS. So that we can have that identity, now we can issue um, certificates to that node, and that node can now issue identity based on that node. And so then the, the, the workload attestators would come into play when a workload comes up. And they'll query, uh, query the kernel, getting, say, the process ID. They'll, if you have a Kubernetes setup, they can be set up to query Kubernetes. What is my pod name? What, is, what are the images I'm running in this pod? All this sort of information that it combines together. Um, so in this scenario, the workloads are completely untrusted. The Spire server is completely trusted. This is part of your CA infrastructure and should be secure just like you would for any issuing authority wherever you're, you're putting your, your root certificates or things like that in your organization. And the Spire agent is sort of in the middle. It's mostly trusted because it's the one that can issue workload identity certificates, um, but a lot of its measurements are confirmed by the Spire server um, as it's doing its work. Um, so the, the other thing to realize here is that workloads have to be pre-registered with the Spire server. So that not just any, that, so that certain nodes can only make um, identities for certain workloads. And so you set that up previously, or out of band, essentially. But um, you can do that manually through the command line, but uh, better ways are through automated processes like a, either your CI CD process during a deployment, or you could also have um, things running on your Kubernetes cluster that will do that as new pods come up, as new workloads start, that they will then register themselves with the Spire server, and then the workload um, is, uh, is registered when it tries to get its identity. So, now we, that we've broken some ground there and talked about sort of these fundamental things of what is zero trust, what is identity, how do we get it into practice? Well, in most situations that you come into, you're not gonna be greenfield, right? You're gonna have a lot of legacy systems that have usernames and passwords and bearer tokens or other sort of secret credentials that you have stored somewhere. So how do you get access to that? Well, Vault is a very common one, some sort of password management system or a secret management system. So how do you then integrate this with your existing workflow. Well, Vault um, can use X509 certificates as its identity, and you can configure Vault to trust the, the, the um, spiffy ID that's in, as part of the certificate. So you can put a, a, an ACL in Vault that says, trust this particular spiffy ID, this sp specific sp spiffy ID coming from these certs, that you then validate the cert and, and uh, you know, prove that it's valid in your trust domain and then they get access to the secrets. So now you have these workloads that have no embedded secrets that can talk to Vault and get the secrets they need for talking to third-party systems if they need to. Um, there's another project called Spiffy Vault, which lets you read 
Um, secrets from Vault based on, from inside of that, that current process, based on that process's spiffy SVID. So if you think of it like the, the scenario here that's really common that this solves is I have a CI CD process, it's a, it's a bash script, but it needs to be able to get some secrets from something. And then, um, so it tries to pull those secrets from Vault, but I don't want to embed the, the Vault um, secret into this uh, workload. So this, when this script starts up in my CI CD process, say in, in, uh, in the Kubernetes cluster, it can get its identity from Spiffy, use that to get the credentials from Vault, and then be able to execute Vault command line um, utilities as if the password was already there for Vault. So databases will work in a very similar way. A lot of uh, the most common popular databases will allow X509 certificates to be used as your identity. Um, so when you configure this, uh, and it, the, the, the details vary by database engine, but essentially you configure the user to be identified um, by uh, different criteria on the certificate. So you install the Spire Trust Bundle, that's part of your Spire issuer. You take the Trust Bundle, you install it in your database engine, however that happens, and then now it can validate that the certificates were signed by uh, a, a, a Spire trusted authority. And then you can do things like say that the issuer needs to match whatever your Spire root is, um, and then that the subject name of the certificate also needs to match the Spire ID or the Spiffy ID, um, which is uh, that URI that we talked about. And so then you can tie Spiffy identi identifiers into database users. And now any workload with those identifiers will just magically be able to connect to the database and have it all work. Another very popular integration here with Spiffy identifiers is your service mesh. I'm assuming most people here know what a service mesh is, but just everybody, raise your hand if you know what a service mesh is. Or, all right, so um, just very briefly, it's the dedicated infrastructure layer that does a service to service communication. And a lot of the, the nice features that a service mesh provide, service discovery, load balancing, um, failover recovery, encryption, and um, security policy enforcement. And there's usually some API to control some data plane and control plane and things like that. The most popular ones, um, Istio, Linkerd, and Console. Um, and uh, of these specific features that I mentioned that server, mesh, server meshes provide, encryption and security policy enforcement are the ones that are really important to something like um, your identity. What, and so some, um, uh, most or all of the uh, service meshes out there have some concept of identity or their own concept of identity. Or maybe they piggyback on um, like Kubernetes identity uh, attributes, but they don't go as far as Spiffy does. Right? When we talked about those attestation features. Spiffy doesn't just trust that the uh, Kubernetes service account is right. It actually interrogates Kubernetes. It, it interrogates the kernel uh, processes and, and then or, or your node uh, deployment on AWS or bare metal or um, even to the hardware TPM if you wanted to. So, so Spire can do these deeper attestations of what your identity actually is. And then we want to be able to leverage that in our service mesh. So when we're talking about Kubernetes, the most popular service mesh is Istio, um, which was a project started um, by Google, IBM, Lyft, and using the Envoy proxy, designed to be Kubernetes native, but also to work in, in uh, non-Kubernetes uh, scenarios to be platform independent. Um, so as part of this communication between like services, most service meshes will do um, MTLS, so mutual TLS connections between them. And the nice thing about that is we have Spiffy being able to issue these X509 certificates, which can be used then as the, the keys and the certificates for um, encryption here. And so when you, you can configure Istio to use Spire and, and to use the Spire secrets. There's a secret discovery service API in Envoy and Istio that allows um, the Istio sidecar to talk to the Spire agent and get these secrets for this particular work, workload so they can share them. And then Spire will take care of rotating those secrets as well. Um, and so this lets you use the Spiffy ID and because we're using Spire, we can go further uh, and deeper into more than just service account. We can do things like uh, make attestations based on the pod name, the container image, the Kubernetes labels, the annotations. Um, and, and so we can use these, these deeper infrastructure um, attributes and, and things that we've attested to 
to then um, have policy enforcement at the, the service mesh level. So switching gears a little bit here, we're talking about supply chain security. Um, so Sonotype puts out a state of the supply, software supply chain report every year. And since 2019, they've had an average of 742% year-over-year increases. That's crazy high, and it's getting worse, and it's going to get worse. Um, I think part of this is not just that, um, well, it, it's because as, as we get more mature as an industry, we're, we're, our runtime environments are getting more and more secure. We're, we're having less and less holes. Um, but it means that they, they've gone looking for other places. And I don't know about you, but I've never been in an organization that put as much love, attention, and money into their build system as they do in their production system. And so that's where the attacks are going. And also, I think hackers also see the benefit of uh, supply chain breaches because you can get something early enough on and have a far-reaching um, uh, consequences for any hacks that you might do. If you can compromise a low-level library that's used all over the place, like log4j, um, then um, you can reap those rewards in, in lots of different ways. So um, who here is familiar with Tecton as a project? All right, not as many, but um, if you're familiar with supply chain security stuff, um, Tecton is a big, um, a big part of that in the cloud native world. But Tecton is a Kubernetes native CI/CD system, or a framework for building CI/CD systems might be a better way to say it. Um, so like in Kubernetes, everything is YAML objects. And Tecton also has some umbrella projects like Tecton Chains that when put together give you first class security features like signed provenance and hermetic builds. And signed provenance basically means that every step of the build is signed and can be cryptographically verified later by someone else. Um, so going further with that, like how do, how, where does Spiffy come into this? Well, there's something called SALSA, S-L-S-A, which stands for Supply Chain Levels for Software Artifacts. And it's basically a recommendation system for software, or recommendations for software build systems. And there's different levels. And as you go through these levels, there are stricter requirements about how your builds are done and the security controls around artifacts that you're producing. But level three, which is the second highest, um, it wants to have a, this one requirement, um, non-falsifiable non provenance. Basically means it's not just enough to say that this artifact was signed, but how do I know some step of the, of the process wasn't compromised along the way? So who cares if I get a binary that's signed if something was injected in the middle or the build process was changed in the middle, right? Um, so Tecton Chains, because of just the way it, it works with the Kubernetes pods, can't guarantee this. It can guarantee uh, the provenance of the build artifacts, but not that something could have modified one of the processes along the way. Um, so like it can guarantee like the steps between the processes, but not that something didn't modify the task as it was running. So for that, you need something outside of that, and that's where Spiffy comes in. So there's a uh, what called, what's called TEP0089, which is the Tecton enhancement proposal, which uses Spiffy Inspire identities on the task run pods in Kubernetes um, that use these X509 SVID identities to sign each um, task run. And so you can tell before and after if the task run was modified. And so it's not just, a, not just the outputs, but that the, the run itself, um, so that something didn't modify it as it was running. So this work is ongoing. Uh, parts of it have been merged, uh, and parts of it are still going. But this is uh, a feature that I'm really looking forward to in, in Tecton. Um, and then as, um, one, as, as Tecton becomes more popular and people are using it further to replace Jenkins and things like that, um, we, people will just get these features by default. Like, when, if you can say, I, out of the box, I, because I have a Spire server and I've connected my Tecton build to my Spire server, I now have Salsa 3 uh, level um, uh, it's also a three-level build system, which is um, quite impressive, uh, if you can get that out of the box. Another project um, that can integrate with Spiffy in interesting ways is a SIGSTOR project. I, if you haven't heard about SIGSTOR, I, I don't know where you've been the past couple of years, but it's everywhere. Um, at pretty much every conference I go to that's mentioned somewhere in a keynote. 
Um, but SIGStore, is, if you're not familiar, is an open source project that handles signing, verification, and checks for provenance. And this is, as someone mentioned at, in one of the keynotes today, this is probably something we should have solved in 2005. Uh, when we think about it. And lots of different projects have tried to solve it in lots of different ways, but never in a really robust, um, easy to use, uh, and um, cryptographically verifiable uh, by everyone system. Um, so lots of big companies are, are working behind, are, are working on uh, SigStore, Google, Cisco, GitHub, Red Hat's one of them. And so it has a lot of this integrations with various build systems and back packaging systems, including Tekton Chains that I mentioned earlier. That's one of the ways that Tekton Chains proves its providence by putting signatures into SigStore. Um, so there's a couple of ways that we can have integration between Spiffy identities and SigStore. So if you've ever used SigStore, one of the, the cool features about it is something called keyless signing. And so SigStore can integrate with an OIDC provider, which is uh, an Open Identity Connect, and can let you once you've proven your identity to some OIDC provider, say Google or Facebook or GitHub or whatever you want to choose, your internal identity provider, it can then use that identity to sign the artifact, produce a temporary key that only lives just for as long to sign that artifact and can tie it back to your identity and then throws the keys away. And so no one can ever reuse or compromise that key and you can guarantee it was signed by the person who owned that identity. But this means that a person has to be there, right? So when you're talking about an automated build system, there's not necessarily tied to a person. And there's not a person at every time a build is running to sign into an OID CD provider with their credentials and say, OK, I, I signed this artifact. So we want to be able to do this in an automated way. So SigStore can use Spiffy as its OIDC provider. And so you can tie in Spiffy um, credentials or, or Spiffy identity, and that's what's used to sign it. And so it can create this temporary certificate tied to the Spiffy ID and then put that into SigStore. So that's how we're using um, this trust model where um, SigStore is basing its trust off of these Spiffy IDs. But let's go the other way around. Let's, um, there's a new experimental feature that's been merged into Spire that allows Kubernetes workloads to use SigStore to verify container, container images. So as I talked about this before, when the node attestators are running and trying to verify this workload, it can look at various attributes of the, the, that workload in Kubernetes, a pod name, what, what image it's running, and things like that. Now, with these features, it can say also, is the image that's running, was it, does it have a signature in SigStore? And does the signature, the, the identities that sign that signature, do I trust them? So, for instance, I can say, I only, in my cluster, I only allow um, images that are signed by M. Peters, oh, sorry, M. Peters at Red Hat to get spiffy IDs and spiffy credentials. And so you can sort of, you can complete this circle and say these containers have been signed, these, I'm sorry, these images have been signed during the SIG store, and now my identity provider can trust or can link that to the uh, um, container running that specific image that's been signed by identities that I approve. Does that make sense? It's a little circular, right? Because we have both things that they can use the other as trust, but this gives us a nice, like, completed circle of, of the build system. So I talked about this before, um, this, this plugin architecture. Um, so now the node attestator can reach out to SigStore as part of its, um, sorry, the, the workload attestation can reach out to SigStore as part of its attestation. So I mentioned at the very beginning that I work on a project called Keylime. Um, and Keylime is, I, I, it's, it's really hard for me to give a talk without talking about Keylime because I think it should be used everywhere. But um, Keylime is a CNCF sandbox project that provides remote boot attestation and also runtime file integrity attestation. Um, and it ties it back to a hardware root of trust. And basically what this means is that you, we can create policy based on your, your measured boot. So as your, your machine boots up and records different things and the kernel knows how to record those and your, your, booter, your, your boot loader knows how to record those and put them inside the hardware TPM or software TPM or cloud TPM or whatever, but these cryptographic devices that let you basically create hash of a hash of a hash of different properties. And so you can make guarantees about those um, hashes um, and then use those to, to verify that nothing has been tampered with along the way. Um, great talks about Keylime out there, but um, essentially what we want to be able to do is say, has this node been tampered with? 
Or if you remember, we talked about the Spire agent, right? We're trusting the Spire agent to a certain degree to not have been tampered with. Well, how do we make guarantees about that? Well, Keylime can make guarantees about your Spire agent not having been tampered with or anything on your system. Um, and so there's a couple of ways that we can um, integrate this with Keylime. One, like we talked about with um, Service Mesh, um, we have um, the, uh, the MTLS connections can be secured through Spire, and, and that's fine. Um, that, that's a, a very common way. But the other thing is that, th and this is a, an avenue I, I have been thinking about. If, if somebody finds this interesting, let me know, and I'll work on this. But if using Keylime as an attestator plugin in uh, Spire, so that when Spire is at, uh, doing an attestation on the node, you can tell it, make sure, or have the Spire agent gather information about the hardware TPM or software TPM, whatever, about the TPM uh, and about the Keylime agent. And then the server side of the attestator can then query the Keylime server and say, does this match, right? Do I know about this node? Is the, the TPM uh, a valid TPM manufacturer? But also, has the node passed attestation? attestation? Has, has anything been tampered with on this node? If anything has been tampered with on this node, then I'm not gonna let it issue any identities. Um, and so this would also, again, give this nice sort of closed loop on, on, now we're not just trusting Spire, but we're trusting the hardware measurements inside that TPM as, as our root of trust for this whole system, for identity system. So it would be very similar to what I showed for SigStore. We would have um, the node attestator on the server side be talking to the verifier to verify that everything is correct, and the node um, attestator on the agent talking to the Keylime agent to get information about um, that TPM and the hardware and the um, attributes of the, the Keylime agent on that node. So if something modifies your boot sequence, if someone injects a kernel parameter that you don't approve of, um, if somebody modifies a Keylime agent or some file on your system and it, uh, that, you're, that you're not okay with, Keylime can fail the, um, the attestation. And then when Spire comes up to try to issue an identity for that node, it'll say, nope, sorry, the node does not pass attestation. And so none of the identities would work and none of the credentials could be compromised. All right, thank you. Um, so I know I covered a lot, a lot of different systems talking to each other, but do you have any questions? Okay, thanks. <laughs>